100 years ago, Ireland was a country in turmoil as British authorities looked to suppress a surge in nationalism. 3 p.m. August 4th, 1918, 50,000 Irish people gathered in an uprising against their oppressors. The British had declared that anyone participating in Gaelic games was to register with Dublin Castle. The GAA responded, calling for a national day of defiance. On that day, more than 1,000 matches were played across Ireland. This August 4th and 5th joined the GAA community in honouring those courageous men and women who stood their ground on Gaelic Sunday. These are our games. These are our people. This is GAA country. Hello everybody and welcome to part two of coaching and managing a hurling team. You're all very welcome tonight, uh, in particular anybody that was in on part one. So just to explain, uh, in part one we started off the first part of the presentation was I suppose what you call is, is um, suggestions and um, the second part was trying to bring the field into your sitting rooms with a few practicals. So uh, in part one the practical concentrated on skills and drills and um, tonight we'll be looking at games and part of games and I suppose um, you know whatever little little plays or um, small side of games all that kind of stuff. So look at again just as, as we kick into it just to be clear you know nobody has the authority or, or the autonomy on what should be done with your teams it's really personal, it's up to yourself really, and it depends on the group you have, the age they are, and I suppose even how long you have them for. So hopefully um, you might get a few ideas, a few suggestions uh, from tonight, and um, you know, in the coming weeks now we're hoping to get them back into the fields and maybe you might be able to bring a couple of nuggets into it. So again tonight I'm, I'm delighted to be joined by Damien Coleman, the Connacht Hurling Development Manager. You want to say hello there Damien? Yeah, hello to everybody. How are you? Hope you're well. And holding the fort then with the Q and A is Dara Cox. Dara again covers Leitrim and Sligo. So Dara, if you want to say hello there, to everybody. Yeah. Good evening, Martin. Good evening, Damien, and good evening to everyone listening. So again, folks, you know, um, if you want to submit a question there for kind of midstream, feel free to do so, and um, Dara can can give me a shout to stop, and we can take a couple during. The presentation if, if needs be, if not we can leave them all down to the very end so it's, it doesn't really matter. So anyway as usual my first slide is, is the um, the Magnificent Seven so I, I won't explain it anymore because you're looking at it now several times and that's my sole intention to absolutely haunt you with these. Now they won't play for me. Folks, never, never before were these essential skills so important. Again, as we get back to the fields in the coming weeks, um, you know, these are the things I would strongly recommend that you get back to. Again, you know, striking and catching, the working tools, hooking and blocking, and hand passing, and you know, raising, of course. So two other little ones there that we mentioned before: movement and not fouling. So we'll we'll carry on. So again, just a little recap. Part one was the focus was on the skills. Skills and drills, which are very, very important. I mean, we all like to play the game. The game is most important. But if you don't have the skills, well, you can't really play the game or you certainly won't enjoy it. So, uh, you know, sometimes we separate the skills. Sometimes we, we interact with them in the game. So it depends again. So again, tonight, a few further recommendations and the focus being more on, on the games. And, you know, in red there, games are most important part of any training session. So I'd like to start off tonight and just, uh, <clears throat> I suppose, get you thinking. 
probably at adult level, um, most coaches will at some stage do a fitness test, if if not two or three of them during the year, you know, to find out how fast a player can run, how long can they last, how high can they jump, etc. And fitness is very, very important. Uh, but the question I would ask is, do we ever skills test them? You know, clubs, some clubs spend a lot of money on fitness testing, and it is important. Now, I don't think you need to spend money on it because you can devise your own fitness test and it's very, very easy to find out, you know, put 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 a few players through any kind of a test, uh, I would say today, tonight, and in a month's time, give them the very, very same test and you'll have a fair idea whether they have improved or not. But what I would throw out to you here is, do, do we ever look on the skills as being as important as fitness? And certainly I, I would, and um, I would say a fitness test, important, but I would say a skills test, more important. Now, all I'm throwing up there in front of you is a little a little sample. You know, how far can a player strike the ball on the right, on the left? Can they rise 10 in a row without missing one? Can the hand pass 5 metres, 10 metres, 20 metres? So what I would suggest to you is, OK, it's very easy to say you do a formal skills test. And we probably won't do that. I know over the years I have done them, but I've often promised myself more than actually delivering. But I would certainly say a coach should be able to look out at his or her players and actually realise such a player can only drive the, the slitter 30 metres on a particular side. So straight away, that needs to be worked on. Such a player or such players, they're missing the jab lift maybe maybe too often. So maybe we need to factor that in. So really what I'm saying to you is um, the skills are most important. And whether we test them formally or not, we really, really should be, I suppose, taken on board what deficiencies our players have in skills and then factor that in into their training. Damien, uh, I don't know if you're ready, but maybe, you know, would you have a view on that, Damien, and we haven't discussed it? Yeah, for sure, Martin. Um, I I concur with all of that. You know, fitness is a very important part of the game and you have to have your body ready for battle and you have to be able to stay the, the full duration of the game with speed and speed endurance and stamina and all that and strength. But, you know, I think a lot of, a, a lot of what's going on presently, uh, you know, neglects the skill side. I'm not sure now in an inter-county setup uh, how important the, the, the skills coach is. He could be five or six back to line because everybody else wants a, a piece of the players um, in preference, you know, the the diet nutritionists are in, they're all important now, don't get me wrong here. Uh, the psychologists are in, the strength and conditioning coaches are in. But I'm not sure, you know, go back go back um, a number of years, you know, the coach was the main person. But now all of that time has been eaten into. And it's very important, you know, to to work on, 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 the, on the weak sides of a player's game. And you'll only know that through the skills testing. Couldn't more agree, Damien. And again, Damien has mentioned inter-county, but, you know, maybe the inter-county players don't need much skill work, but they actually do, but you might say they don't. But if you bring that back to club, even club senior, club underage, um, you know, what I've noticed often with some very good coaches, they have a slip of paper or they have a little notebook in their pocket. And throughout the training, they're taking notes. You know, Johnny, is he missed a hand pass. Martin missed a jab lift, you know, and taking a few little notes during training, that then can form the basis of some of your actual coaching sessions. So anyway, to, to, to move on a little bit, um, it's all about games at the end of the day. And I've said several times, if you went down to the field and did nothing, only played a game, it would be a good training session. Um, this little slide just harps me back to quite a few years ago when I was standing on the sideline for some kind of a junior game and... Um, Somebody turned to one of my colleagues and said, we'll call him Mikey. Mikey, you must love hurling. And um, Mikey says, he, of course, he, I sure, I love it, he says. I'd actually die for the game. And he paused for a couple of seconds and turned back and then said, if I could get a game. So he'd die for the game if he could get a game. So this, you know, that, that, that stuck in my head, saying that, yeah, this happens so, so many times. We have so many players and they don't get games. Now, maybe... You know, if you join the golf club, you get a game every time you go down. So if you join the snooker club, you get a game every time you go down. So I'm not saying you get a game every night you tag out in hurling. But what I'm saying is you want to be getting plenty of them. So the game is what we're all about. 
So a, a little suggestion here I would make, and this is relevant to under sixes, the same as is relevant to an inter-county senior panel, to record a number of games that players get. Now, you can't give them all championship. Everybody, there are only 15 laying out in a championship game and whatever number of subs you can bring in. However, between challenge matches and whatever tournaments, etc., I think it's a very, very good exercise if a manager or even a manager delegates somebody else to keep an eye on who's getting what. And if somebody gets a quarter of an hour, well, that's 0.25. If they get a half an hour, that's 0.5. And maybe have a look at it every few weeks. And that you don't find after, as I have there, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, after eight games, Joe Rice got no game. Now, maybe Joe Rice is a student, maybe he was away in college, maybe there were reasons, maybe he was sick. But you know, more than likely, Joe never missed any training. But just maybe Joe is not as, as good maybe as some of the other players. Um, so again, you know, to keep an eye on it. And I would look on it in two ways, folks. I would say morally we have an obligation to give the players games, to provide games for them. And, um, you know, they pay their membership, they're coming to the field, they're training, they want to be part of it. Now, it does take work. It does take a lot of work that you're basically going off and you're getting matches basically for your subs and people that are not getting, getting games automatically in championship. So I would say morally we do all to players. But I would also say, and I'd be strong about this, if you're interested in winning, and of course we're all interested in winning, if you don't give all your players plenty of games, it can cost you. It probably will cost you. Now, it mightn't cost you until maybe you win a championship and you're in the club championship. And suddenly you find yourself with maybe one or two players suspended, two or three injured. And your first five subs, that were normally your first five subs, they're now playing. So your second five subs become your first five subs. And maybe a couple of them are called in or get injured. And suddenly in the match that you have to win and maybe you're down a point or two, you bring in Jimmy. And Jimmy hasn't got a match for two months. You know, and as we get further into the championship, it's harder to get extra games. And who does the chance fall to to win this match on Jimmy? Ball drops in his hand on the edge of the 21, he throws it up and he misses it. And you say to yourself, you lose the match by a pint. You say, was it my fault or was it Jimmy's fault? Well, I would say it's my fault as the manager because I neglected him. So anyway, you, you get the message. Um, so two reasons there for keeping an eye on the number of games people are playing. Another little tip, and I don't know where I came across it, it could have been up with Dara there and Sligo. Um, good, good advice, not just for an individual manager, but for the club to carry out maybe a little, we call it an audit, once or twice a year. And this is very, very simple what's written up there, but basically you have your different age grades. And a couple of questions you might like to ask. How many players, many teams, we'll say at under 16, how many teams? And then the key to it, how many games organised, we'd say, by the county board? How many challenge games? Any little blitzes? Anything like that? How many coaches you have per team? And, um, you know, number of training sessions, indoor, outdoor. And you find and see, if you look at something like that, fairly regularly, I would say regularly two, three or four times a year, you probably will improve your club. And you might find that, look at uh, the under-14s, we're, we're doing a pile of work for them because they're probably talented and they're probably a chance of winning an old title. But maybe the, the, the under 12s, maybe, ah, they're not going to win anything, so maybe people neglect them. So it's funny, you know, when you actually write it down on paper, uh, what you might come up with. Dara, you're, you're up in, I suppose, in, in two of the counties there, and they wouldn't be in the headlines when it comes to hurling. So would you, would you see it any different up there, Dara? No, it can be hard sometimes to organise challenge games if teams aren't getting a proper number of competitive matches organized for them but what you'll often find is that the really proactive clubs will will make a weekend out of it and they might go somewhere not too far away for a couple of for a night even and maybe play a match on the saturday and a match on the sunday now this is obviously an older age group for that but again that comes down to just you know a little bit of organization a little bit of thinking outside the box and the other big problem is when you're in a in a, an area with a small number of clubs, is you you tend to play the same clubs a lot. So you do want to try and get yourself out of your comfort zone as best you can. And Dara, Dara, you managed Sligo there to win the the um, the Lowry Mar there a couple of years ago, and um, they moved on and then won their record the year after. 
how important, you know, would you have found actually trying to give games to your full panel at some stage? Well, I learned a, a big lesson, I have to say, towards the end of that. Uh, as it happened in the round robin section, we did enough in our first two games to qualify for the final, which meant the third game uh, was a game that we didn't need to win. So what we did is we changed the team around and give lads that deserved a run their chance. But the problem was we made too many changes and the lads didn't felt like feel like they got a chance because everybody was new and some of the stronger players were out and they were coming to me and, and saying, well, we you didn't give us a chance to play alongside the good players and how am I going to stand out in that scenario? And it, it was it was a bit of an eye-opener for me that I thought I was giving lads a chance, but reflecting now, I don't think I was. Yeah. So you're looking at a, a kind of a mixture. And, you know, interestingly enough, even, you know, we're, we're talking here more so in a club scenario, it is actually good for the stronger players to sit on the sideline a few nights and actually see what life is like on the other side of, of the fence. Um, anyhow, fitness, folks, is, is, of course, is very important. You know, and again, we're looking here primarily at, at an adult team or maybe a youth team. And let's be straight about it. If they're not fit, they're probably going to be blown out of it towards the end of the game, unless they're extremely skillful and the team you're playing are, are not that skillful. However... I would be a very, very strong advocate that when you're in the season, as much as possible of your fitness work is done with the ball. Now, that can be in um, in drills, which we looked at last the last night. There are so many drills and skills work there that, that absolutely would have your tongue hanging out. So, you know, when you're in, in championship time, I would say use that ball 99% of the time. However, I want to spend a few moments now looking at would say a small side of games that can give you that fitness as well, plus a lot more. You're playing a small side of game, let's say a five versus five. You're getting a huge amount of running, you're getting a huge amount of touch, you're getting tackles, you're getting challenges, you're getting hoops and blocks. You're getting a seriously amount more of work than you would in just, would say, running up and down the field. A um, couple of suggestions, you know, let's say you're playing seven aside, maybe you only have 14 players in the field. Well, if you want to, you can play at a full pitch. Or what I would regularly do is pull in the sidelines so that players have the same amount of space as they would have if they were playing a 15 aside. On another occasion, I might shorten the pitch and maybe have a full back line and a half back line and a full forward line and a half forward line. And, you know, the guys playing up the field, you have a, a line of cones maybe on the 45 yard or the 30 yard line. And when they reach there, they, they just shoot for points, whereas guys playing in up the other way, they're playing normally. Um, I have a couple of little slides coming up here now that you might find interesting. This one, the fitness gains in small-sided games. Now, I won't take credit for this. This is the result of uh, a bit of work done over in, in, <clears throat> in Carlo IT College uh, a couple of years ago. And, you know, again, it was to try and find out what value was in small side of games? So we we'll say, okay, I'm going out to the field tonight and I need to do a bit of fitness work. And I'm saying, can I incorporate it into small side of games? Well, very, very briefly, what the lads came up with is in a 10 versus 10, and I just have three little arrows there, for three minutes, so 10 versus 10 for three minutes. So obviously, if it's for three minutes, it's going to be flat out. The average distance covered per player was a little over 400 metres. So that's not bad. In three minutes, you're covering 400 metres. Down at the bottom there, the number of accelerations was 17. So, you know, you were getting a sprint or almost a sprint, but you were getting a change of pace, 17 of them in three minutes. Now, to me, that's that's very good. Now, the rest of the of the bits and pieces there, they don't concern me hugely, to be straight with you. Maximum speed, average speed. I'm not too worried about that. But what I'm worried is, you know, how far they travelled and the, and the number of, of changes of pace they got. A six versus six, played for just two minutes. Again, they're almost getting on average 300 metres. And this is the one place where I actually would agree with the GPS. You know, I don't like it in matches in the slightest. Um, but, you know, to find out what players are covering in training and, and 
Dominic McKinley, Woody there, he mentioned that they used to they got out of it up in Slock Neil with the girls, you know, that using it in training. Now, again, I wouldn't go buying them, but if you have them, if you can get your hands on them and get a loan of them from time to time, you can find out some information. So, as I said in Carlo, this is what they discovered. So, the six versus six, almost 300 metres covered by the players on average and 12 accelerations. Now, go down then to a little three versus three. One minute. Now, one minute is a long time if there's only three versus three. Again, 173 metres distance covered and 10 accelerations. So, apart from the running at the accelerations, you know, look what you're getting in hurling. You tackle a, a player, tackle a player for 10 seconds, ball on the ground and you're twisting for That's serious fitness training. Trying to cover three players, six players, 10 players. That's serious work. So, again, making a play there for the value of um, the small side of games. Now, I'll jump through a couple of slides here. Again, talking about small side of games. Possession type games that can be unopposed. So a little possession game where you're, you're unopposed. You're just basically passing the ball around. I'd class that as easy, okay? It can be used as a warm-up, but you're getting ball work. You're getting a level of fitness. Possession type opposed. So if you have the reds versus the blues, well, if there's a large number, it's pretty easy. You know, certainly if you have 50 in a side, I wouldn't be on for 50 in a side for a possession game because most players won't see the ball. But, um, you know, even if you've brought it down to 10 a side, it's reasonably easy. However, if you reduce the numbers, a pause possession, and you're bringing it down there to maybe 7 a side, 6 a side, now it's getting a little bit harder. Match type, large number, medium. Match type, small number, difficult. A drill type, Savage. So what I'm talking about here is in a couple of the things I'm going to show you now in a moment, I would say um, just to grade them. If it's a match type exercise, it's medium difficulty. If you got a smaller number, it's a little bit harder. But if you're playing, if you're doing a drill, that's a kind of a component of a game. You know, one player tackling another there for 20 seconds. That's savage. That would kill you. So again, just to have a, have a little look here, a couple of suggestions for you. A little mini game there and the one on, on the left there. Um, you know, two ways of doing it. You have players in a section and you have the ball moving up and down. So, you know, sometimes something like that, it gives the player a little, I suppose, appreciation of, of space and shape. That, And for youngsters, it's really, really good. If you have under sixes, under eights, and you mark off a certain area, well, they won't be all chasing the ball around. And it will give them a little bit of appreciation for, you know, lining out on a pitch. Now, with all their players, it's basically one-on-one. -on -one. And you're fighting your opponent to move the ball into the next box and into the next box. Now, we'll have an arrow down there at the end because you can, you can adjust this and you can say, right, when a player gets it at the end of the pitch, he or she has got to run around the cone and bring it back into play. So it's going up and down the field. When a player gets it at one end, they've got to run around the cone with it and bring the game in again. And needless to say, you rotate the players in the middle because they're going to get most of the match. Um, one on the right-hand side there, very, very simple. So we've got four players at one side of the field and four at the other side of the field. And again, you know, that's taking eight players. So if you had, um, you know, 32 players, well, you have four, four of these units working up along the field. And really all that's happening is the ball lands in between four players there, two versus two. Whoever wins it, pucks it back. And then you have a little game on the far side. Now, you can, you can introduce little conditions if you wish. And I would introduce to that, for example, if the Blues get the ball, before they clear it, there has to be at least one hand pass. So that's going to make a little match out of it. And the second rule I would make is, unless you can clear long, which is right over the field to the far side, which is going to be 70, 80, 90 yards, if the long clearance is not on, you're not to strike. So again, what you're looking for is, you're looking for serious closing down of each other, and eventually somebody will get a little bit lazy or a little bit tired and the player in possession, they'll have two or three yards free and they'll be able to put the ball to the far side. So again, look, at there are literally hundreds of these little things you can come up with yourself. So just again, throwing a few samples. This one is basically, it's almost like backs and forwards. So the guys there, excuse me, I should have changed the colour to try and be not biased tonight, but the black and amber lads will say they're starting, the keeper starts with the ball and they're trying to work the ball out with short passing and hand passing. And the guys in red there are trying to stop them doing it. So basically the backs, it's a little facet of a game 
where when you're under pressure a long clearance is not on you have to work it out and when the black and amber boys get the ball out past the cones there which can be wherever you want them 30 or 40 yards out then the goalie has another ball and the race back in and start again or an alternative is which is quite good let's say the black and amber guys get the ball if they're able to work it out over the cones they immediately then become attackers now if the red lads take it off them well obviously then you know whatever way you want it they just keep ball so you can make up your own little rules now this one again is just picturing out there 9v9 there on the left normal playing around any way you wish on the right hand side i have them boxed off the one on the right hand side again sometimes folks it gives that little bit of awareness of space and shape and playing your area now you can be very strict on it if you wish which means when the ball comes in between two players that's it they battle it and whoever wins it moves it on to another another box or you can have it loosely and i i like loosely where i say look at guys we might throw a few little cones out try and only have two players in each area now if there happens to be four in it for a few moments that's not a problem but as soon as the ball goes up the field two of them get out of there all together that you're just keeping the field spread out um i wouldn't be too worried about scoring in something like that what i'm looking for is playing the ball over playing the ball out playing the ball in just basically getting used to winning ball and then moving it around the field the scoring is incidental you can have it if you want it um damien do you want to chip in there at this stage with any of that kind of stuff i have a few more coming up yeah look at um for sure martin all that's very impressive like it just what strikes me there you know the game is at the center and we're trying to improve fitness and we're trying to improve technical decision making and team play but the game you know you're loyal to the game while you're doing all of those and uh, i understand that you know the learning is in the game and 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 for the player the drug is the game so they come from miles to train and you know it, it would be remiss of us as coaches to abandon the game and if you can have the you can have all those small sided games to develop the speed you had a, a slide up there um, on maximum fitness and the and the distances they're covering so look at all of the fitnesses done there sports specifically so look at brilliant it's absolutely great stuff yeah so again folks th the last night i kind of mentioned in passing that look at broadly speaking i'd have the session divided into two <clears throat> the first half skills development and the second half a game but then i think i said in reality I actually divided into three so would say a third of it and not necessarily equal shares but one part of it would be working on skill development definitely striking and catching every single night i'll be doing it raising the ball all of that um, then i'd pull out a section and it might be just 10 minutes which i would call maybe a component of the game that needs to be worked on so if for example your players and this again you know you're surely going to have it at under 10 and 12 but you could also have it at adult level where they're all following the ball and they're not holding shape in any way the good teams they're able to keep shape when they need to keep it and they're able to close down the game when they need to so if you had a team and they're just very very poor at keeping shape you might look at five or ten minutes of that little game on the right hand side where you might even cone it off and say right lads look at i don't want you all in the same place at the same time let's see can we open up this and when you open up a game it becomes one-on-one -on -one, and that's where you'll be found out then very very quickly if you're up to the skill level um this one again is just possession so again my little take on a possession game is when you're playing a match if this if the clearance is not on or the shot is not on you give a hand pass so when you're under pressure you throw a hand pass and then when the shot is on if you're a defender obviously you clear it if you're an attacker you take your shot so this little possession game is to try and work on that so again in a in a little area there look what have i there a little bit less than a quarter of a pitch and you might have seven on seven eight on eight and you could play away there for two or three minutes and the role you make them up yourself the role is you know every time you, you get a strike away and, and one of your colleagues gets it cleanly that could be a score all right in reality if everybody is working hard there's no way anyone should get a shot off so you hand pass out of trouble then you might say right if you string three shots together it's a score it's up to yourself now before i go into something like that i would do what i have on the right which is unopposed possession so on the right hand side there you have we'll say eight black and numbers and eight 
red lads. And the black and ambers have a ball of their own and the reds have a ball of their own. And all they're doing is they're doing a bit of short striking and they're doing a bit of hand passing, but they're sharing the area. So they're getting used to having other bodies in the area. So you might play that maybe for three or four or five minutes and then you might take out one of the balls and say, right, now it's contested. OK. This little one here, again, I said last week to you or last week in, in part one, you know, the coach, you know, you must know what number you have in the field, the number of players you're coming that are coming down. If you're organizing skills and drills, you should have it on a little slip of paper or definitely if you have a good head where you're going to do the different things that you're not wasting half the night setting up. And definitely if you have a bit of help and you can move from one bit of work to the next bit of work in different parts of the field, it keeps the flow into the training. So all we're looking at here is the top little one. They're all playing what we used to call three goals in it. There's one player in the goals and the other two are competing. Now, that can be even with seniors, that can be all on the ground or it can be a mixture. OK, OK, Damien, or Damien or turn off the mic, 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 turn the goalie um, after a score. Now, so that, that then has moved on maybe to two outfield versus two outfield. And again, with little simple games like that, if there's a component of the game you need to work on, supposing you want to work on high catching, well, then you can say, right, every puck out is a high ball. And that gives you a little bit of practice on the high ball. If there's a component of the game, say, taking on each other, you might puck the ball out to the side and alternatively, you know, the first ball comes, I'm getting it, I'm getting the possession, so I'm running at you then, see, can I get past you? Next ball, you'll get it and you'll run at me. So again, all little, little mini games. The one in the middle there is five versus five. So again, I put a lot of, I would put a lot of merit in five versus five because if you have 30 players, right, there's 10, right? Do the same on the right-hand side, do the same on the left-hand side, and that's your 30 players in three little games. Now the bottles in the middle there, definitely with this, this is high intensity. When you have small numbers, you want plenty of recovery. Um, again, look at, Three versus three, whatever, make a mix in it. Dara, do you want to chip in on, on that there? You know, these small side of games, are there benefits, if any? Yeah, there's huge benefit. Of, and a very important thing you have written there, Martin, as well, is about changing opponents after every game. As, as important as it is to vary what you're doing as well, I would say it's very important to vary what lads and what girls are up against each other because you don't want a fella up against a player that's stronger than him and it ruins the night on him because he stuck with him for the night and we've all been given the run around at some stage. Uh, it does happen, but just by keeping it varied, it keeps it, it keeps them interested and uh, it, 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 it presents a new challenge every couple of minutes as well, which is vitally important. Yeah. Yeah. And again, folks, just to emphasize again, it's only my own opinion. You know, I love the small side of games, but not for the whole night. Again, to me, and this is to me, it's not, you know, it's not the gospel. The main part of the night is the full-sided game, the, whatever number you have. If you have only 20 in the field, that you're getting a good 20 minutes there, maybe a half an hour of 10 aside, whatever you have, okay? That you're not spending the whole night on the small stuff. I, that's my opinion, but again, it might not be yours, and that's that's 100% okay as well. Um, This one again... It's just, it's just a little support one. Again, you might find, and I call this a component of the game, that your players are not good at supporting. So really all we have here is when a player will say, if I take the little cork fell out here in the corner, if you can see him, um, when he gets the ball or she gets the ball, the two nearest players, and this is unopposed, the two nearest players race up to that player immediately. And the ball is hand passed to the first player, it's hand passed to the second player. While that's happening, all the other players get as far away as possible from each other. So if you think about it in a match, and let's say a cornerback, the ball goes into the corner, the cornerback goes in for the ball. Nine times out of 10, he or she is going to be under pressure. So the fullback races across in support, the wingback races back in support. Now, cornerback passes to the fullback. So he 
or she probably won't have a chance to clear them. Might take the second pass to the wing back before you get an opening to clear. So while that's happening, all the other players are scattering around the field, getting into position. So let's say the, the full back gets it and the full back throws that little hand pass to the wing back. Now the wing back has a bit of time and a chance to look up the field. They scan the field then and see what player is the farthest away from them. And they see, can they give an accurate pass up to that player? And as soon as that ball is heading up to that player, the two nearest players to that person are on the way up again. So again, I don't want to bog you down in, in you know, how you do these things because you have, you're as good as them as I am or anybody else there as bad. Okay. Um, this one you'll be all very familiar with it. You know, for five minutes there, put up a, a lot of goals with cones or poles, whatever you have. And the score is got by carrying, carrying the ball through a set of goals. A couple of little rules. You know, you can't score in the same goals twice, maybe. And of course, you can't have somebody hogging it and standing in the goal. So again, any of these little games, you're, you're hoping that the players are going to buy into what you're looking for. Now, so look at, with the short-sighted stuff, just in general, smaller groups, you get more ball contact. Smaller groups, it's harder work, there's more hits, but you want to work for shorter periods. A smaller area, OK, you're going to have less running, but you have more contact. So you could have a little exercise there. Do it in a small area one night, do it in a large area another night, and both of them have different benefits. Large area, you know, seven aside, the whole field. Wow, you know, 10 minutes, seven aside, everybody going flat out, like the Kilmacud sevens. Look what you're getting. Then on another night, you play a seven aside, and you have the sidelines pulled in maybe 20 yards on each side. So different, different game, different part. And to me, over a period of time, you know, you try and experience every aspect of the game possible. Um, with a lot of the little games, the little mini games as I call them, I would, especially in, in, in the winter, especially in the wet, if the ball sticks in the ground, it don't have any rooks. So <clears throat> normally I would just say, right, if the ball goes to ground, whoever dropped it, the other team gets possession. I must, or I would just call it. I must say, right, yellow. And everybody backs off except the yellows. Um, again, I think it does make sense putting players in groups of similar fitness levels. Because again, if I'm if I'm matched off there with Dara and he's just way fitter than I am, and it's a one versus one situation or two versus two, and I'm, I, I'm down on my knees after one or two balls, that's not much use to Dara. So, you know, I think that is important. And the same even if you're doing straightforward running, which we do a certain amount with the, with the adult teams in particular, I, I always believe you're better off matching players of fairly similar abilities so that they're getting, they're pushing each other and there's nobody falling off their back too much. So if you have, you know, if you have six players and they're just way off the mark towards your top six players and you put them in the same runs, well, if they're going to be 20 or 30 metres behind every time, it's not doing their heads much good. So, you know, maybe in that time you want to shake them up a bit, you might put them in with the faster lads. Um, players enjoy working with the ball, folks, and playing games, so why, why don't we do it? Okay, um, right. This one, this little slide, I think, is very, very important. And um, I, I'll get the lads' opinion in on it now as well in a moment. <clears throat> I just call it moderation. You know, the nose of coaching. Now, again, I'm saying they're nose for me. They may not be nose for you. And that's fine. As I said, nobody has the gospel on, on this sport. That's for sure. Much and all as we love the hurling, much and all as a player you love to be down, I'm firmly convinced if you're down too often, you're going to lose freshness. And I'm, I'm, look at, I've seen it so many times and it can come from, for different reasons. Maybe it become coaches just trying to do the thing right, trying to be, you know, trying to match the guys in the next parish, trying to match the guys in the next, in the next county. And I say, All right, they're training three nights a week. We'll train four, we'll train five. It doesn't mean you're going to be better. And I would be, I would be positively certain folks that if you can come to that field fresh, it's way, way better to be unfit and fresh than to be fit and stay. Too much talk, and you're hearing it from me now, you know, too much talk on the pitch, a disaster, especially in the cold nights, you know, and that's something I know I had to do it myself. I had to ask one of my selectors sometime to give me a bit of a nod if I'm talking too much, because you have so much you want to say, you have so much you want to input, but the players can only take on a certain amount. And it is very, very good practice, in my opinion, to get one of your colleagues to some little signal, and even not a signal, say, Martin, that's it, you're, 
you know, I've told them, don't have me talking for any more than a minute maybe when you pull the players together. Don't pull them together too often. That's a disaster. Same in the meeting. Now, bringing players from college or from work or whatever, especially in the winter time, in my own opinion, is there a benefit? You know, a player is in college and, and they're going to sit in the car for an hour and a half each way. That could be three hours driving to come down to the field and what, do a bit of running, do a bit of exercise they could do back into college. You know, and then they're going back to college and maybe they have studies to do when they're not feathered or hungry. You have to ask yourself, is there a benefit? Because if there's not a benefit in it to the player, you've got to change it, right? If the player doesn't benefit, there's no point because what's training for? Training is to improve you. And if by me sitting out every third night because maybe I'm pushing on a bit or maybe I have a bit of an injury and if that's best for me, well, then that's what you got to do. You know, you don't play me just to make up the 30 on the night and it may be going to do damage to me. You don't bring, in my opinion, the lads from miles away, let it be work or let it be um, college, just so that you'll have a full attendance. Maybe that's good for your ego, but it mightn't be beneficial for the player. Too much video, you know, and I'm into a little bit of everything. A little bit of video if you have it, and it doesn't have to be something you buy, you know, it could be anything. It could be videos of other teams that are doing things well, or maybe they're not doing things well, and you might want to point them out. But too much of it, in my own opinion, it goes over the head. People spend a huge amount of time putting it together, and then they feel they have to give it. But, you know, they're wasting their own time putting too much together, and the player can only take up so much. Too much time in the gym. You know, you will never have time to cover everything you want to do. And you must understand that from the start. And that was never as true as it is now. You know, in the coming weeks, there's a hundred things we want to do with our teams. You can't do a hundred teams. You don't have time for it. And if you overburn them, well, it's a disaster because you actually end up then putting in the time, but not reaping the benefit. Um, I, I called the two lads in here just on those couple of points there. Damien, maybe if you want to, to throw something into the pot, your own opinion on it there, please. And any of yeah. might have to add? Yeah, look, at, um, for sure, um, you know, it has to be quality versus quantity uh, for overload and for all the sports specific stuff. Um, less is more would be, would be, you know, a mantra coaches should maybe adopt uh, less with quality versus uh, more with quantity. And really, the more you're doing, Martin, you're psychologically and physically burning players if you keep, if you, if you know, if you keep bringing and bringing and bringing, and uh, as you say, the freshness is gone. And um, you know, players come and 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 those small-sided games that you were you, you were working on there over the last uh, number of minutes, you know, physically and psychologically, uh, players are challenged in those. And um, there's been a lot of presentations now and webinars over the last number of months with the with the COVID. And you know, the, I think the basic message here is once. Once you're playing games, you're achieving what you need to achieve with the players. You know, you've got your technical in it, the skills, you've got your tactical, which is your decision making. And once you bring tactical into anything and there's decision making in it, you know, that's a higher level of, of output um, cardiovascular there, the heart and lungs for the player. And then when you bring in your team playing and, and, and that's all aligned then with the physical fitness. But for sure, um, less is more. Thanks, Damien. Dara, have you any knows? You know, again, you're, you're vastly experienced there, um, inter-county and club, and and again, you know, you're 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 in counties there where you don't have the numbers regularly that Damien and myself w would have in our county. So, are there any knows that you've come across, or anything there you want to chip in on that? Well, it it can be frustrating with low numbers at times, but equally so, apart from. Uh, training, having too many training sessions and, and not being fresh, the, the repetitiveness in the training sessions can also lead to a stainless. And there's times we now, even in the senior club team, have been at a training session and we've decided to leave the hurls on the sideline and we took a frisbee out and we went round the pitch throwing the frisbee to each other. We did it another night with a football, another night on an astro pitch with a soccer ball, just to make it a little bit different. It might only have been for a warm-up or it might have been just to, to, we might have been working on something in terms of players um, moving about a pitch and, and, and trying to um, increase their spatial awareness. But again, it was something a little bit different and that little bit of freshness just added to the training session hugely. Super, Dara. Yeah. Thanks, for, 
Thanks Martin, I, I, yeah. I might come in there for a second. That's yeah. blowing my sport specific out of the water, Dara, with his frisbee. 100% <laughs> of the ball, 100% of the time. But no, they're, they're great ideas. One thing I just left out there, Martin, on the return to play protocols there, some of the some of the clips you had up there are fantastic because, you know, you had a larger area with more running and less contact. And when the coaches bring the players back now on, on after after June the 29th, legally and officially, uh, into the clubs, you know, you're going to be looking at stuff where there's no contact. And I know this is alien to the game we coach because, you know, you want to have as much contact and you want to have as much decision making as possible. But, you know, coaches are going to have to be more inventive. How can they train more technical skills? And uh, But the large area there with more running and less contact, I think you've given out a lot of ideas on that there earlier. Thanks for that, Damien. And David, folks, you know, and I, I'm not a medic, but um, while we'll all love to get back to full contact, you know, we're probably better off actually not. Because if you go down, you know, it's, it's like the player that's injured and they're back after three months and the first night bang straight into a full match and then they're injured for another six. So a graded return. So the fact that the little bit of separation is, is going to be imposed on us initially is probably a good thing. Will give us a chance to to loosen up the old legs and um, get the few skills back in again and be very, very careful that you don't overcook it. OK, look, I'm spending longer than I thought on these slides, but we'll keep it going a little bit faster now. Um, again, just little tips, things I might have done, things I might not have done over the years. A little player self profile, and I, I've, I've seen there was a webinar given over totally to this. Now I forget who who, who gave it, but um, very 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 simply, because this is going back a while, so I, I hope you can't actually see it, the dates on it. But um, it was really reflecting from one one year to the next, and uh, a little a little a little self reflection for players. And needless to say, the coach or the manager would have a look at it as well. But you know your 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 aims, your personal objectives, maybe for the coming year. Uh, and maybe the team ones from your perspective. A little look back to the last year you played, you know, to rate yourself. How would you rate yourself? And I'm just throwing a few here. Fitness, skill, attitude, mental, never say die approach. How would you rate yourself? Fair, four to five, good, six to eight, very good, nine to ten. Uh, other little things, strength, commitment, effort in training, ambition. That's a big one. How would you rate yourself in ambition? Then I had a little section there on discipline. Silly fouling, you know, how would you rate yourself? And um, I might ask them and he might give himself eight, but I mightn't agree with that. I might say, well, hold on a second, you're, you're actually giving away four or five frees in every match. Other things, mounting to the ref, you know, it's important because you mount to the ref, it brings the ball up 10 yards. And, and I know my own club, we have lost matches on account of that. And it could be just once that instead of um, a player driving a ball in around the 21, he brings it forward 15 metres, puts it over the bar. So a um, couple of little things. A summary then maybe for the following year, what, what are you going to do as a player? Are you going to do anything different? And maybe you're not. And I would always ask, as a team, you know, the team management training, is there anything you think we should do as a management? And um, down at the end there, you may not be able to read it, but I would regularly maybe even ask the players the start of the year, you know, what team, what 15 do you think should be out there? It doesn't mean I'm going to take it on board, but I will read it because I don't have the gospel on on the on the best 15 or the best place and then sometimes you know if you ask the players you know what's your opinion and they might say such a guy uh full forward maybe instead of wing back and you might say which yeah, i could have something there he has a good hand or whatever so i'd be i'd be big time into um listening and listening and listening okay i just keep it going here you know in in any team management there are there are relationships okay and what are they well, basically, there's two parties, let's say, in, in a team set up. There's the player and there's the manager. Now, when I say the manager, I mean the management, you know, whatever, your selectors, your coaches, call them what you like. But there's two there's two parties. However, there's, there's three relationships. And we got to see that. There's the player and the manager. How does the player, you know, how does he behave towards the manager management? How does the player behave towards the player? And the bottom one then, how does the manager behave towards the player? And at the end of the day, if we lose sight of what's on the right-hand side, there's only one team. You know, we're all the team. Whether you're a selector, whether you're bringing the jerseys, you're bringing the water, there's only one team. And our aim is, obviously, you're getting into championship is to do as well as we can and maybe win the thing. So 
if we don't pull together and if we don't work together and if we don't have respect for each other, we're not going to be as strong as we could. And we all know about the chains and the weak links and that. So I would just say to yourself, as a manager, as a coach, whatever, be, be, be mindful of these things. And, you know, going back to the little profile there, the players sometimes, maybe they don't think, they don't think that, um, you know, that I, I should be behaving in a certain way towards the other players. I should be behaving in a certain way, maybe towards the, the management. So no harm to be to be prodding these little things. Now, um, respect is a is a big one. And I have I have never seen, you know, I've never seen teams get on well where there's a lack of respect. And again, from the player to the manager, management from the player to the player, or the manager to the player. So again. Not saying you should do it or you need to do it, but I just know I've, I've done it on occasion. Um, a little code of whatever you want to call it, code of ethics, um, player to manager, player to player, manager to player. I just pull a few out from the player to the manager. Not a fire manager if you're going to be absent or late. You know, that's, that's common manners. And that does make sense. Check maybe with your manager before you make arrangements which might affect matches or it might affect training or it might affect the team. Do not undermine the efforts of the manager or other players. These are little things that if people only read them, they might say, Jenny, um, yeah, yeah, maybe maybe I need to pick myself up a little bit here. I have one down there near the end. Do not speak negatively about the management methods or other players. If you have nothing good to say, then say nothing. Then I skip over player to player. Treat all players with absolute respect. Like if you're lucky enough to be one of the top players, and I've seen this in practice so many times, you know, you have to realise that you're fortunate to be one of the top players. So have have due regard and huge regard, would say, for the, the players that are on the, on the tail end of the panel. Do not think yourself superior to other players. The last player on the panel is as important as the first. A big one for me, no player has a divine right to a team place. You know, and something to have. Um, another one, I could go to them all, but I won't. Play your part in training. Do not drag it down with anger, sulking, messing or dodging. So again, all we're doing here is reflecting. Manager to player. Treat all players equally and with respect. That doesn't mean you'll pick them all. You can't do that. All you can do is say, look at guys, we'll put out the team that we think is the best team. It might not be the best one, but it's the best one that we can come up with. I'd be certain with part number two there. Don't be a bully, abusive or critical. And this one, you know, give praise and credit when it's due and try to be positive at least most of the time. Now, we're not all, you know, you're going to go down and like players. It's not all going to be smooth, but be mindful of these things. Support and encourage players, especially when they're under pressure. It's easy to clap the backs of the guys that are hurling well or the girls are hurling well. It's easy to do that. But when a player is under pressure, that's the time they really, really need you. You know, when a disaster goes in, the goalie lets in a ball that that did stop with a raise shot. That's the time they need someone slip down, give them an old drink of water and say, Martin, don't worry about that, it's the next one. That's the key, okay? Um, I'm driving on here now just to move it on a bit. Players own responsibility, folks. And it's a big one. You know, everybody has the same chance in the training field. But the difference is made up. When they go home, the difference is made up on the non training nights. And I can assure you, you know, any county you're in, and Daryl said with the boys above in Sligo, and I heard Emma O'Shea talking about the lads in Tipperary, and I know Damien will be mindful of this with the Galway lads that the difference is made by what players do in their own time. And I said in the, on, the, on the webinar we did on the goalies, we had, I think, seven or eight of the top goalies in the country, and they all said the same thing. You know, you go down to the ball wall, you go down to the field and you do your bit of striking and catching, etc. So, players' responsibility to work on their skill. You, know, you don't have enough time in training to work on it. Fitness. There's no point in blaming the management that there hasn't, you know, Martin, he hasn't as fit. I would say, sure, the field is not locked, lads. You know, if you think you're not fit enough, go down and get yourself fit. You don't need a, a degree in, in whatever, social science or anything to know how to get fit. A player is responsible for their own nutrition. And again, I'm not talking at club level of high-end nutrition. I'm talking about a bit of common sense. Rest and recovery are huge, and we talk about that in a moment. Injury prevention, player's responsibility. 
if you have an injury or a bit of an injury, speak up. Okay, you'll always get guys and they're dusting and they're dodging, but you you know that's that goes with it. That goes with it. But you know, if you have a niggle there, if you have a bit of a, a strain there, you want to tell the management that you you don't want to go on that night and, and make it worse. Now, you know, how many of us have walls? There's a wall in every house. Okay, unless you're living in a tent. And if you are, you could put a net in front of it. But there's no point in having a wall, folks, if, if the players don't get down to it. Get down on that wall. And again, this is what the goalie said. Get down, get down, get down and work on your skill, work on your touch. So if you can foster an attitude among your players that they will go and work in their own time, then you're there. Then you are there. In an ideal scenario, on the night of training, you should have nothing to do when you pick two teams and play away. That the players, now this doesn't exist, but you know, in an ideal scenario, um, you know, that have all their skill work done in their own time. Now, here's an interesting little slide coming up. And again, this was one year, I think, with the club in particular. We played 27 games. We lost 13 of them and we won 14. However, on a little bit of reflection, I discovered we lost six games by less than four points. We lost seven and by more than three. Now, more than three could have been 23. We were hammered, maybe. So what I'm saying is here, it's amazing the number of games we lose by a handful of points. And I know for certain those six games could have been won very, very easily by a little bit of discipline, maybe, from a player, a little bit of extra work, a hurl up for a hook, for a block, not chopping, not holding a lad's arm, silly freeze given away. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable the little margins in close games, how we give them away. And it's so hard to get a score um, that we shouldn't be giving them away easy. Two important courts in age. Two, I'm, I'm getting mixed up here now. Damien, would you have an important coach in age? An important coach in age. Before I show what I have here, what would you think? Um, One. Can you, and I get Dara to pick another. Well, the most important coaching aid I'd have now in the return to play would be the wall ball. Okay. Dara, would you have a, an important coaching aid? Uh, well, some sort of plan of what you're doing and some sort of way of reminding yourself of that plan in the middle of the session would be handy. Okay, boys. I had to say, but none of you came up with what I have. This is for players. Most important coaching aid for players, the mirror. <laughs> All right. And you look into the mirror, lads. And you see what's in there, not what you want to see. And so I don't look into the mirror and say, Damien gives Lonnie a comb there, will you please? Right? <laughs> and we'll have a little laugh on it, but it's so serious. I mean, the good players look in the mirror and they see what's in there. The good players come off a match after maybe playing very well and they're not happy because they'll say, Jenny, if there had to be a close game, I missed a hook or I missed a block. You know, I didn't really chase. So... A really, really good player looks in the mirror and sees what's in there. Now, for management, good pair of glasses, right? To actually see what's out in front of your eyes. And that is difficult. We all look at matches and we all look at players and we kind of see sometimes what we want to see. But sometimes we don't actually see. Yeah, look at Johnny hasn't conceded a score there in the last five games. OK, he's not spectacular. He's not striking any massive ball, but he's doing very, very simple things well. You might find, you know, a player that you have a lot of time for and has been around for a while is actually not playing well for the last six or seven sessions. But your little head is saying, ah, he's all right. And maybe a young player is in or an old player is in or somebody else is in and the last six or seven sessions, they've actually been very, very good. So to actually see what's in front of your eyes is, is a huge, huge challenge. OK, now. I, I would be positive on this. One of the greatest skills a coach can have is to listen and listen to all their people. People that have been around before you, people that have made mistakes and know the mistakes they made. Darius mentioned something earlier there that he, that he would have done differently. And listen to people that have succeeded. I mean, we don't all have to reinvent the wheel. We don't all have to find out the hard way. You know, and if you have somebody in the club and they say, look at I've seen this happening before and it didn't work out well. Well, I would listen to them. Now, whether you take it on board or not is up to yourself. Another player, you know, it could be something like, you could have a player in, own, in my own experience, it could be a 38 or a 39-year-old player, and you will know in your heart and soul this player has a good hand and has a good finish. Now, they mightn't be as fit, they mightn't be as fast as before, 
But someone might say, ah, he's gone, he's over the hill, leave him off. Somebody else might say, you don't have someone like him, throw him in. Well, I'd be inclined to throw him in. Anyway, you get my drift. Um, now, factors that affect the player's performance. Without a shadow of a doubt. And again, years ago, there was no science. Um, if you look for a drink of water, it was a sign of weakness. But if there's one thing that has been proven in, in, in recent years is that the importance of hydration. And sometimes I take a bit of convincing, you know, with something, let it be science or let it be anything. I take a little bit of convincing. But um, the hydration one was very easy to work on because somebody was actually put up on, on a treadmill or up on, a, on an exercise bike for X amount of time with no water. And then they fell off it. And then they were put up a couple of weeks after on the same exercise bike or on the same treadmill, okay, with water, and they lasted longer. So it's just very easy to see that with water, you last longer. Without water, you know, you won't. Um, rest and recovery, diet, obviously. You know, if you don't have the fuel, you're not going to perform. And again, we had the myth before that you, should, you shouldn't be eating a couple of hours before you come to play or train. And what happened then? You got weak. Whereas, you know, the little bit of science has shown proper proper eating, proper drinking is going to mean that that car has oil and petrol is going to last longer. And as the lads mentioned earlier there, mental freshness. How do you buy into that? So, guys, um, again, I'll push it on. I have, I have two slides coming up here that I got a number of years ago from uh, Dr. Niall, Professor Niall Mina from DCU. And they stuck in my head. And again, you know, as I said, sometimes I take convincing, but... These couple of slides stuck in my head as making so much sense. And I've used them quite a while, and, and I thank Niall there for allowing me to use these, but um, they just make so much sense and never were they more relevant than in the coming weeks. So again, um, it's about fitness level and recovery rate. So if you can see it on the right-hand side down, there's kind of three players. There's A, a highly trained player. There's B, a moderately trained player. And there's C, an untrained one. I suppose that could be Damien there. Sorry, no, Dara, highly trained. Damien B, moderately trained. And poor old me, untrained. Okay. And um, there's your, your pre-training fitness level. So right, we'll say at the moment, we're at that level. Now, you do a workout. You train. And needless to say, you train, you go down. So you're wrecked. You're tired. Okay. You go down in the dumps. Your, your, your energy levels are good down in the ground. All right, so it takes C, which is me. It takes me there, according to that graph, three days to recover. Well, you could put a, two more days onto it at least. So an untrained player is going to take three days to recover to get back to where he was or she was. Dara, or which of the Damien, is a little bit younger, he's a little bit fitter, and he'll recover maybe in two days. And then whichever Dara is the, is the elite athlete there, and he'll recover in one day. Now, lads, that is very, very important. And age comes in there as well. As you get older, it takes you a little bit longer to recover. Okay? So, in my opinion, that makes total sense. And the older I get, the more sense it makes, because the longer it takes to recover by doing the same activity. Now, you take this one. If there's inadequate recovery, and this is what we're faced with now, in the coming weeks, folks. Okay? And bear with me now on this, but again, there's your your mark, your benchmark. So there's where I am today. I train. First session, I go down. I'm tired. I'm wrecked. Okay? Ideally, I'll have whatever three days to recover, and after a good training session, and after ample recovery time, I'll be fitter. So if my dotted line there was, was my standard today, and after training a session and have an ample recovery, I should be a little bit fitter than next week. Now, however, if I'm brought in for my next session before I'm recovered, well, I'm going further down. So if I was down six foot in the ground and I have to train again before I'm recovered, well, I've gone down another three foot. Now I'm down at nine foot. All right. And again, I would need more time to recover. And if some coach decides he's really going to test my, my, my resolve and bring me on the third night maybe in a row, well, then I'm gone altogether and I probably never recover. So really what happens is because I don't get adequate recovery, 
I am going downhill fast. And folks, I've seen it with my own eyes. Trust me on this one. And I said, if Professor Niall Miner had went and put these slides together, and if he's coming out with it, he's a guy there that has done so much research into all of this stuff. But a person like me that has never done research, I've seen it with my own eyes. Lads being flogged to death, and what happens is good players become no good. Whereas the player that might be, you know, maybe come to the field in that time, he or she has plenty of recovery and you're getting them fresh. Okay. So anyway, um, a little one there I came up with. Many of life's failures are people who did not realise how close they were to success when they gave up. Um, Damien, or Dara, or, or just uh, Damien, before we go into the videos, do you want to chip in on anything in the last couple of slides there? We'll start with you, Damien. Uh, yeah, Martin, I, I, I sort of... Very with you there on the 48 hours minimum recovery and less is more. We've all that talked about there. Uh, all those slides there are very, you know, scientific and they're very objective and they're, they're based along the principles of, of training. So, you know, I, it, it, you know, it's very apt now that it's coming in to a month there where, where players have probably done very little for a while and now coaches are going to try and make up the, make up the load and making up the load flogging players you're going to injure them and you're going to break them down and the bodies are only able for so much so you know be, be very clear about the, the 48 hours recovery minimum but as martin said there it may take the three or four days depending on the fitness levels coming in uh, just on the ball context there martin you know there's we, we spoke about the wall ball there and we, we spoke about the non-contact so anywhere clubs there have walls get onto your walls let's i I see coaches and teams all over the country and they're walking out past the finest of walls that somebody fundraised and, and put in. And just it's because maybe you don't know enough to use it and you don't want, you feel a bit embarrassed if, if, you're, if you haven't got um, an armory of skills for it. But technical development will be done there on the wall and uh, you can keep your social distancing. You can coach up to 30 there on, on, on most walls uh, in twos, 15 twos with the social distancing the non-contact, and you can really challenge the players physically um, and psychologically there on the wall with decision-making and the technical there, you know, uh, very definitely at the heart of it. And just to, to go back one more, Martin, there, the elimination of toxic behaviour in a group. I think it's vital, lads and ladies on the call. You know, it's of destructive nature. Um, people left disjointed, good people in clubs, good hurlers, good camogie players and, you know, because of a, a toxic behaviour going on, they're disjointed and they're gone away from you after all the years and it serves nobody well. But, you know, what we used to do in our own club there in Portumna over time, we, you know, the group, the group held the individual accountable and any sort of misdemeanour there, it wasn't the management's job, this was an agreement that the players would have their little chat there and they'd call whoever into the middle of the circle to explain whatever. And they'd do that themselves. And I think that's very powerful, a group contract, if the players buy into that and the players holding the players responsible and accountable. So that's just a few little chip-ins there, Martin. Yeah, super, Damien. Toxic, I like it. And again, you know, it's like the old, the bad apple. It just will rot the, the, the pile and... Um, Niall Williams there last week, um, you know, they mentioned in, in the Camogie there about their, their little their little section in the book there uh, that was kind of dealing with disruptive players. And these are things that kind of have to be addressed. There aren't any straightforward, simple solutions, but a few little guidelines and a few little um, discussions make a help. Um, Dara, do you want to chip in with anything there in, in the last few slides? Any, anything different than what Damien has come out with? There was an interesting one about rest and recovery, Martin, that it's worth taking into consideration for all coaches as well, in that if you have a lad that's living across the road from the pitch and he's coming over for an hour and 15 minutes of a training session and you have another young fella that's driving maybe 40 minutes to a training session, he's sitting in the car for an extra hour and 10 minutes and you have to maybe ask the question, is that is that a two-hour session that that man is doing as opposed to the one hour, 15 minutes that the lad living across the road is doing it may not be that situation but it's worth considering yeah Dara, that's huge you know that's huge you know and again it's 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 good that players would say they're they're in training you know we'll say we'll all say a half an hour before the start of it but to be mindful of players that have to travel is unbelievable and, and it's a huge insult to them 
if the player that's that's close to the pitch doesn't care less, you know, and, and is not cognizant of the fact that somebody is, as you're saying, sitting in the car for an hour, an hour and a half. I got, you know, my eyes were opened up and up and Donegal there at the um, the interest level. A lot of the youngsters have. I mean, I was up in the camp there for a couple of years, and some of the youngsters they were an hour and a half to get to the venue. Couldn't believe it. I mean, you go from the top of Kilkenny to the bottom of Kilkenny, no problem in an hour. So um, we need to be mindful of those things. So anyway, um, folks, we're going to move in now to the, the practical end of it. And as I said, the last the last night um, we were working on the skills. So tonight we're looking on games and and parts of games. And the, I'm vicing over them there, so you, you won't have to listen to me talking twice. Um, I just get a, a start on it now. Jump forward. These are all up on the YouTube anyway, as you're well known, as you well know. And this session tonight again is, is being recorded, so we'll have it up for you tomorrow. 40 and 37. Now I'm looking for here, and I hope this all works. 40 and 37. Okay, we'll let her roll there, Colette. This is a little possession game, which again can be used in a confined area first and maybe later on in a wide area. It works on hand passing, striking and moving into position. First of all, the players are working unopposed in order to master the techniques and then they move to an opposed game. The objective in the opposed game is to get as many accurate strikes as possible without losing possession. If a strike is not on, the players use a hand pass. If the players that do not have possession are working hard enough, then their opponents should not get a strike away. Condition games like these replicate a part of a match and can be very beneficial. Fouling is not allowed at all, as that would result in a free, and a free normally results in a score. So players are encouraged to pass the ball with their hand if the strike is not on. They're encouraged to move into good positions. Those that don't have the ball are encouraged to pick up the man with the ball or pick up the runners. The position game using maybe 7v7 can be worked in maybe an area of 40 meters by 40 meters, but then it can be extended into maybe using uh, a quarter of the pitch or a third of the pitch, as would be in a normal game where you have six forwards and six backs, possibly inside a 50 meter line. This is another example of a difficult game that will not suit all players. Uh, can again can be worked in a confined area and also in an open area. Players compete to shoot for a point. When in possession, the players are not to shoot unless the score is on. In other words, they don't waste the ball. When they are not in possession, they work hard to ensure that their opponents cannot get an easy shot. For variety, players can maybe be allowed to leave the box or more players can enter the game from different parts of the pitch, again, to replicate a match. Twelve players is the ideal number to give those players enough work to keep them busy, however, with sufficient recovery. Absolutely no fouling is permitted, as a foul in the game amounts to giving your opponent a handy point. In the example here, there are far too many players waiting for their turn, so ideally another coach would take half of those players up to another set of goals. With all of these exercises, if a player is deficient in raising the ball, or hand passing the ball, or striking the ball, you'll very, very quickly see that the drill doesn't work, so you've got to go back then to the essentials or the basics of striking and catching, raising and handling. This game initially works on hooking. The game commences with the striker allowing his opponent to hook him 
to build his confidence and technique. Then after the initial hook, it's game on and each player attempts to score a goal. The game works on hooking, blocking, taking on your opponent, standing up your opponent and striking. It also works on the goalie's skills and is excellent for fitness. Ideally, six players on each side of the goals gives a good mix of working and recovery. We can call this the goalie challenge. We all started our hurling with this exercise played in the back garden or school field using jumpers or school bags for goals. This is a great exercise for shooting, blocking, catching and general sharpness. And once again, depending on the ability of the players, you can vary the distance between the goals. The game is the most important part of any training session. A variety of games ranging from 1v1 to 15v15 all have their own values and will help to develop the complete player. Players should be given experience in all positions and a range of conditions can be deployed to focus on various components of the game or partic particular aspects that the coach wants to work on. Here we have a 6v6 game which is very very beneficial as players are getting plenty of ball, there's plenty of space and it encourages skills that might not be developed in a 50 in a side. Sometimes it's good practice if you have 30 players and you intend playing a 50 in v15 you might spend 10 minutes playing three sets of 5v5. So your 30 players are getting plenty of movement and plenty of ball. To neglect ground holding, in my opinion, is foolish. There are many times in a game when a quick flick or a ground strike is the best option. It could be to score a goal or to clear a line before being closed down by an opponent, or to get a ball in quickly to a colleague who has just found some space. I favour a normal game of hurling where players are encouraged to focus on ground hurling. You might look for an emphasis of say 80% ground hurling, which means that if it's foolish to play the ball on the ground, you don't play it on the ground. But at the same time, your emphasis is on striking on the ground. The key to any sport is to practice and master all the individual skills. Then, at a given time in the game, to decide which skill to deploy for maximum gain for your own team. Here is an excellent example as to why ground hurling should be practiced. It's a magnificent goal scored by Fergal Whiteley from Dublin against Kilkenny. People can ask how long it took to score the goal, maybe a fraction of a second, but it actually took about 10 years of ground hurling practice. Once again, we see another example of a magnificent ground strike. Seamus Cannon in the All-Ireland semi-final against Wexford, scoring an outstanding goal. Almost all of should have a part of it. That's what we're about. That's what we are ultimately training for. So if we have 20 players at training, we play a 10 v 10. If we have 30, we play a 15 v 15 at some stage. If the numbers are less than 30, you can narrow the pitch on one occasion or you can shorten it on another occasion to engage all your players. So remember, the game is what we are all about. Players join hurling clubs to play the game. However, we cannot play the game without the skills, so it's about getting the balance in your coaching sessions between developing skills and playing games. But remember, if your full session is all a game, 
That's a good session. Now, folks, um, we hope you got something out of that there. Um, so look at, we'll go into the Q&A here now in a moment, but uh, just, just in case I forget it, next week, um, we're getting towards the end of our series. We, we have next week, we're calling it Developing a Coach and I, and the following week, we're planning on doing something international, and that will more than likely um, close our hurling specific webinars for the moment. Um, Next week, we're looking at something a little bit different. We're going to get in a kind of um, a team in the audience and can call them a team of players or a team of coaches. And we're going to look at clips, video clips, and we're just going to see, right, what, what do you see? Very same as if you're down in a dressing room and you have a few clips and you're asking your players, right, here's three minutes of a video. Are there any coaching points there? Same with your few coaches. So that's, um, that's, that's the gist of what's happening next week. So, um, look at folks, we'll, we'll go into the Q&A now, and as I said, uh, you can have the questions there for, for Damien or myself or for Dara, and um, we'll, we'll see where that takes us, okay? So, Dara, um, I'll hand it over to you there now with, with your questions, and any hard ones, uh, drop them to Damien. How does that okay. sound? That sounds fair enough. Uh, there's one here now that's come in that, that caught my attention straight away, and I probably should have uh, mentioned that when I was talking about throwing a frisbee around the hurling pitch, that that session still required 200 touches of the ball, or I would have regarded it as a, a poor hurling session. Damien's dead right about the sports specific, but in terms of that, uh, Martin, you know, the, the amount of touches uh, a, a hurley or camogie player needs to be getting in a match, what's your thoughts on that? Or not in a match, sorry, in a, in a session. Dara, you know, I, I'd never be into numbers, you know, and I, I've heard people talk about you get 500 of these, you get 200 of these. All I, all I would say is, you know, the, the skills and the drills, and some people are saying, you know, you shouldn't have cones and you shouldn't have drills. I would not agree with that in the slightest. Um, if we get out in the field a half an hour before formal training starts, and between pucking high and pucking low and coming to meet the ball, you're getting so, so many touches, just as many as you can. And the fastest and the best place to get that is against the wall because that ball is just coming back so, so many times. I mean, I'd be, I'd be promoting playing the games, but I could fall out in a the game there and I could be marking you, Dara. And, you know, how many, how many opportunities to catch a ball am I likely to get in a, in a half an hour of a game? There might, be, there might be four or five. There might be none. So, you know, when one does come to me then, important, and I drop it. Whereas if I get out with a colleague and I'm poking her rim up against the wall, you can get so, so many of them. So that's that to me is where, you know, is to get that balance. Skill work, skill work, skill work, touch. Because if you fail to pick one ball in a match, it can cost you the match. If you fail to strike, if you fail to strike accurately, it can cost you the match. Okay? Uh, a question in from, from Brendan, who's been a, a regular uh, contributor to these Monday night uh, sessions as well, Damien. I think it was you that... that coin toxic, toxic practices there during it. Uh, and Brendan asks, uh, it might sound obvious or certainly when you hear it, uh, toxic practices, but can you give some uh, any, some examples of what sort of behavior that you really do need to try to avoid or nip in the bud uh, as soon as you can? Yeah, and thanks, uh, Brendan. I, look, just from my own experience, um, you know, it's a destructive nature. Um, you know toxic behavior in the group but I, I try and be proactive um when you be coaching i i wouldn't be looking for anything specific now if stuff hits you right in the nose there or on top of the forehead of course you'll you, you'll you'll know it's come at you but what i do brendan in advance um of that i give the power i think it's very powerful when the group hold themselves accountable to the group and when the when the individual player is held accountable to the group by the group so if, you know, the way I'd go about managing that is I'd be proactive. I wouldn't be looking for anything. I'd be trying to eliminate and I'd be giving the power to the players. So if a guy missed training, you know, the group would go off there for two minutes before the session would start. They'd be doing the warm up and they'd have a quick chat. Some one of the leaders in the group would emerge and they'd say, listen, step in there. 
Martin Fogarty, you weren't at the train the last night, explain to the group where you were. You see, that sort of stuff um, done regularly right eliminates um, and, and it doesn't allow things to fester. So that sort of thing. Um, I think toxic behaviour I'd be talking about as well, Brendan, would be, you know, lads judging sessions and trying to get a, an angle on the manager and the management and everyone is everyone is off and stale if they're not picked. And then they bring two or three with them and then the whole thing goes wrong. So let the group be strong and let the leaders in the group emerge. And I'd sort of give that role. Now, I hope I'm answering your question, but I'd give that role there um, to the players. And I'd, and, I, and I'd be in regular contact then with whoever the leaders you'd appoint to do that for the group. Just on that, Dara, um, you know, a couple of examples that I would see staring straight in the face would be, you know, when you're doing your coaching <clears throat> and maybe a player or two would say, ah, this is useless, you know, this is no good. And suddenly that's that's going through the players. And the big one to me is, is, is maybe, and again, you're probably at an older level, is the dugout where... You might have a player that's constantly chawing and constantly telling the lads, you should be on, you should be on, you should be on. And that's that's toxic. And that will pull it down. You know, the hardest thing to do for any management team is leaving lads on the line. But, you know, it, it has to be done. So if somebody is constantly chipping away at the structures like that, you know, you even sometimes you see a player maybe trying to be nice and tell a guy, Martin, yeah, you should be on. But I've yet to see a player who says, you should be on instead of me. So that that kind of stuff is 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 huge, you know. And if if you were to look at at inter county level, and I was lucky in that we didn't see it, but you know, your players coming into inter county level and they're automatic on their club team, and suddenly they're lucky if they're getting a game at all, maybe at inter county level. So you know, if there's any kind of negative jives going around there, that can pull a whole team down overnight. So okay, Dara, so we'll 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 and take on the next one there then. Martin, I might just come in briefly on that again because it, 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 it's it's a very important area. I seem to think too, Brendan. Um, you know, outside coaches get appointed, and and you know they need to lean on somebody from within the group or the club to get their views and and, and to embed themselves in it. And you know that can cause a rift then between between you know which is they're leaning on A, B, and C there, and they haven't asked our opinion. So I I think look at the outside coach coming in. You know, needs to be very neutral and very objective, and the participation feedback there within your group. Uh, we we always as coaches sort of dictate and we're sort of domineering in nature. I think we need to listen to the players more. Martin had a big slide up there about listening, lads, and we need to ask the players. You know, what went right there? What didn't go so well for you? How would you fix that yourself? I think if we were facilitating players more that way as opposed to uh, always going with, you know, the sentence that I, I know all about you and I have all the cures for you. Let the players fix themselves. And that happens through feed, a feedback loop there uh, by asking the players to be part of, of fixing the problem through participant feedback. Just for my own take on that, uh, one thing that I think is a, a, a really poor practice, a really frustrating practice, is this idea of getting lads to check in on a WhatsApp group because as soon as one fella comes up with an excuse, you'll follow it very quickly with two or three more excuses as well. And uh, it's just the nature of it. Um, not not always that that can that can bring down the mood in a group even before a training session even starts. Um, Martin, you mentioned about player assessment or a self assessment from from a player. What if you as a coach and the player don't agree on that assessment. Oh, well, you probably you probably won't agree with it. Um, again, it's a kind of um, Dara. It's a kind of a reflection between you know the, the coach's opinion or the manager's opinion of the player and the player's own opinion, and um, who's to say which is right? But you know, again, at the end of the day, ultimately players play and and management manage. So whether a, a player likes it or not. Um, you know, the manager or the management is the boss and they're going to be picking the team. And I can remember back in my own playing days, okay, it was only club, but uh, to me it was hugely important. 
And if you were getting feedback from the management, well, I would very, very quickly say, well, if 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 Michael is over the team and he's telling me I'm not working hard enough, well, I'm not working hard enough. <laughs> so, so there's no point in me thinking I'm right and I'm sitting on the line. So, you know, and again, when I would throw those profile things, if you want to call them that, I, I, I don't know, did I even call them that, out to players, it's, it's like it's like having to sit down with a, a, with, with a player, having a cup of tea and, and just trying to to see it from each other's side. And, you know, Damien harped on it there. I, I would listen to players, but it doesn't necessarily mean I do what they say. Everybody can't manage, everybody can't pick the team, but I most certainly will listen to opinions. And it, it, would, be, it would be foolish not to. And definitely on the day of a match, I would hand it over to the players, 90%, 95% out in the field, lad, gee, back to decisions. I'm not going to start telling you you should put the ball here or put it there. And so it's, it's about empowerment. But at the same time, you know, you're over the team, you're picking the team, the book stops with you. So that, that would be my take on that, Dara. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, I think it does. Um, one here about the recovery time as well. And certainly in, in my part of the country, Martin, there's there's an awful lot of uh, dual teams and dual players and dual clubs. Um, Getting that right, um, and a suggestion coming in here about only training hard every second week, I suppose a, a light session one week and, and a hard one the, the second week, I guess it, it comes down to communication though, doesn't it? Yeah, what you're looking, if 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 anyone was, was clued into the Schlock Neil webinar, and if they weren't, um, it would be, it'd be worth looking at it, because, you know, not only were they dual players, but they were top class dual players. I mean, there were players that were getting, that were winning Ulster in both codes, and they, they made the football All Ireland final, and they were a couple of pucks of a ball away from making the hurling. So, you know, I, I know from, from Michael McShane up there, a good friend of mine, from a hurling perspective, they do no physical training, they do all skill work because these guys are fit enough anyway. And that's 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 a big one. That if you're coming to the field, let it be hurling or let it be football, and you're playing both codes, you're fit enough anyway. So you know, so you're concentrating on 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 we'll say the skill work in the hurling, getting used to each other, and probably the same in the football. So again, um, I just remember this Loch Neil had saying years ago that um, the manage the new managers coming in to take over a team. First thing they were told was this is a dual club, and we treat both codes equally. And most important is the player. So if you put the player as most important, then you won't go far wrong. And if you have honesty, and, and the Schlock Neil lad said it, you know, okay, there'll be an odd lad messing, but by and large, Damien comes down to me and he says, Martin, look, at, I, I, I'm wrecked after the match there last night or the night before, I'm, I'm a bit shook. And I say, well, you, you sit out of training then tonight. And that's, that's, that makes sense. And look, at, I've seen that at inter-county level. So, so, so often, you know, for different reasons, different players need to set out, step out of the training or step out of certain parts of it. So in a club situation, maybe you're doing a bit of tough stuff. Maybe you're doing one on one or two on two there, little little drills, and you might leave the fatigue player out of that and just let him into the, to the, the, the full match part of the thing. So again, you said it there as well yourself, there are common sense, which unfortunately is not that common. <laughs> Uh, Damien, what do you think of an outside coach coming in as a manager in a club and making his assumptions on a, any player based on maybe one or two players within that club he may be friendly with? Or it mightn't even be players, just it might be one or two connections in the club that are very quick to give their opinion and he's going with that because he's an outside manager. Yeah, look, at that can happen. Um, there are people going with the best intentions in the world into everything. But, you know... If 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 you're an outside coach and you're coming into a club, um, you're going to you're going to have to use soundboard somewhere, and um, that does unfortunately um, can be of a destructive nature and it can disenfranchise um, other everybody else. So look at, I think like you know most clubs, to be very fair, lads, um, there's enough expertise inside in every club in Ireland for them to manage themselves. And I'm I'm sort of against the outside coach every night. I, I, I feel the outside coach should be guest appearances. Uh, but look at, uh, yeah, it, it's a hard one to balance. There's strong individuals everywhere. And um, somebody, you know, people can get pulled in and they need to have soundboards. 
uh, and then you know that can disenfranchise everybody and so I think when you go in you need to be very objective you need to be very clear and you need to be for everybody uh, but again I'd like to get the message out here that I think clubs go for the outside coach that's the first uh, job of business nearly before the AGM every year and I think we've the cart before the horse I think there's a lot more expertise inside in the club trust the people within get them up and get them coached up on the on the awards there through the coach education programs with our coach education officer nationally Peter Horgan award ones award twos train up your own trust them and then bring in the guest person maybe a, a night a week as Martin said freshen it up and if you were a guest coach coming into your club once a week that gives energy to everybody but you're also trusting the people inside in the club that are building the club fundraising and are doing everything else and imagine people coming through the systems and they're good enough to take the nursery and they're good enough to take the juveniles and they're good enough to take the minors but then the players decide they're not good enough for us that that's a killer for me so i think the ga the whole thing needs to shift it needs to be club people internal are appointed and then if you need to bring in a guest person once a week uh, for for a fresher upper or a bit of more expertise that's fine but not every night that's well said there damien a lot of wisdom in that and um you know at the end of the day folks if, if there's somebody coming in from outside you know they're they're reliant on who you produce for them from inside from within and you know they need it but again in, in, in my opinion, you know, whether it's within or without, I will listen. But at the end of the day, I'll need to see it with my own eyes. I don't know what the man in the Bible was and he had to put the finger into the Lord's hands. I need to see it. Uh, and it's good. It's good to have a, an open mind on it. But I mentioned earlier about listening to people. And if somebody tells you that you can trust, you know, you want to be aware of it. But to actually see it with your own eyes, that if you're down and you're after doing six or eight or ten training sessions, and if a player is standing out a mile that he or she are, is playing well, well, she is seeing it with your eyes. Pick him or pick her. And if they're not playing well for whatever reason, you don't pick them. Anyway, harping in on... Go ahead, Sarah. Okay, um, Martin, the question here about, I guess, a lot of people have June 29th on the mind now, of course, when we can kind of get back in some sort of uh, uh, group training on GA pitches. Um, games in the non-contact training session martin what's how can that if we're talking about making sure that games are the center of our, our session can can we incorporate non-contact games do you think well dara um again that depends on the age group you know if if you're working with the little people whatever under 10s 12s um there are there are several little games and plenty of them on the ga activity planner there might be a few of them being being put out in, in the coming weeks uh, that are little games. But I suppose, essentially, for your youths and adults, which tonight is kind of geared at, you know, if you're two metres apart, there's really, there's not a game as in a contact game. Okay, you can have a possession game there that's unopposed. You can have a goal to goal, you know, the goal is challenges, we call it, but you're very, very limited otherwise. So, you know, what I would say is, between tonight and the last night, we'll say the last night we put up, and again, a huge amount of drills that um, a lot of us put time into in, in gathering them and, and putting them together. But every single one of the activities we had on the last night are ideal for the first three weeks where, where there's social distancing. It might be just involving tweaking them a little bit, pushing players back a little bit further. Now, what we have tonight, Broadly speaking, apart from, I suppose, the um, unopposed possession and the goalie challenge, you know, they're, they're all contact. So to me, that's kind of coming into your, your, your second three weeks. Now, in case I forget to mention it, just again, with the games there tonight and with some of the drills last week, on purpose, we didn't edit them. And several of the drills, and I, I might have mentioned it on, on, on last week, but even there tonight, I meant to mention it, you know, several of the drills there, there were too many players in a particular drill, too many players standing around. But that was that was for, for demonstration purposes. And it's it's important that people note that. 
Equally so, especially in the drills, you know, players missed balls, they dropped one, the drill didn't work perfectly. And, and that, that was on purpose. We didn't go out to, to kind of set up a set of drills and exercises that are perfect uh, because there isn't perfect. So when coaches are looking back at those things, very, very clearly watch. And I think there was a little hooking game there that we had where I might have said we have way too many players there. That should have been made into four similar games. And the same there uh, last week there in, in the nursery one, Damien and, and, and his colleagues, you know, have some very, very good quality uh, drills and exercises off on the Connacht GA web center or we website. But again, they were put together in the gym, which wasn't the field. So the space was confined and they were for demonstration purposes only. So it's important people watch that kind of stuff. Damien, are there okay? Yeah, great stuff. Um, a message in here from Stephen. I was an inter-county hurler back in the day. 90% of the sessions are still the same. Striking, lifting, tackling, etc. Uh, but there is a huge focus, obviously, now on fitness and nutrition. Uh, do you have any ideas, Martin, for the team or panel to take the responsibility themselves as players to come up with their own uh, drills or even come up with their own session? Do you think that's a, a way forward? Yeah, well, Stephen, you're a man of my own, <laughs> my, my own heart. The game, you know... The game hasn't changed. Okay, how people play it can change from year to year, depending on what they want to do. At the moment, everybody seems to want to get the ball in the hand and you know, they want to hold it and they want to find a player and that's fine. Now, that could change this year, it could change next year. Um, you know, Looking back at some of the games of years ago, there was, there was quite an element of ground hurling, which has almost disappeared. But it's just waiting for someone there sharp like yourself or Damien there to take over the team and, and start whipping the ball around a bit more and start winning a few games. Um, players' responsibility for, for, for what, Dara? For the nutrition or for coming up with exercises? No, the question now is related to coming up with drills and coming up even with uh, to formulating the session themselves. Yeah, well, look, at I, I, Jenny, I would be forever asking players if there's something um, that could come up with that would improve our training. And, and again, you know, I'd work off of a handful of drills to be fairly similar because if I was a player, I like to be doing more or less the same thing every night. I want to strike every night. I want touch every night. And so I don't want too much variety. However, in particular, if there's an aspect of the game that we need working on, and I would regularly ask a few players, you know, is anything you think would work well there and we might try it out maybe. So yes, the answer to that is a most definite yes. But again, it comes back to me then if I'm over the team to decide wh what happens or what doesn't happen. There was a question come in about uh, the testing, fitness testing and skills testing, Martin. Um, I assume that the question, I've lost it here in front of me now, but it was mentioning about doing that them skills test. That, that's something, there's no point doing this at the start of the season, and I, I'm sure you'll, you'll say, and, and leaving it to one side and not going back to it and not, not retesting or else you, you don't really know where you stand. Yeah, well, look at and, and we'll see what Damien thinks on this. I mean, I would be a, a, a strong advocate at underage of formal skills testing. In fact, I would love to see every club having a person and, and that person, you know, that don't have to have any awards done and maybe going down and saying the first Saturday in every month, there'll be a skills test and any youngster wants to come down and get tested because, you know, the, the greatest challenge to a player is themselves. And if I'm going down with, say, uh, this Saturday and we'll just take the strike and I'm striking 40 metres on the left and I'm striking 60 on the right. Well, if I can come down a month later and get tested again and see the improvement. So at underage, I, I would definitely think because youngsters like that and they can see their progression and to have it done formally. Now, as, as you get older, they're not going to buy into it really much. However, as a coach, I, I'd be doing it. So I would definitely come out and say every third or fourth session, I'd have players striking as far as they can strike. And let's put them back on the 14 yard line and say, all right, the next five minutes, boys, girls, all on your right. And I'd observe who can puck and who can't. And then I'd say the next five or whatever, three minutes, all on your left. Now, a very, very straightforward rising drill that we did the last night in part one, I am observing. I am watching the players coming out two opposite three, and they're picking with two hands, they're picking with one hand, and I'm observing how many are being missed. And if I'm noticing that Dara Cox is missing every second pick, I'm pulling them aside after and saying, Dara, your eyes is brutal. 
right? Let's be honest about it. So you better start working on it or you're not going to be playing. And, you know, so you can do that incidentally in your training. You take catching. Again, long striking. Started the training session, cross the pitch, which is 90 metres. And let's say a young adult should be well at to strike a ball, come in 10 yards from the sideline, put them up in the clouds, boys, girls, put them up in the clouds and catch. And you're watching then who can catch every ball, but more importantly, you're watching who's dropping them. Now, if they're dropping them, unopposed, poking across the pitch, well, are you going to put them in cornerback? Are you going to put them in fullback? I'd be saying, hold on, <laughs> you got to work on this a bit more. So that that'll be my take on the skills, Dara. Damien, maybe, Damien, what, what's your take on that? Yeah, look, for sure, Martin, um, children love a challenge and they love a little bit of stimulation. And when you give when you give them the opportunity there to be tested, you know, the skills there, challenge tests, uh, even striking a ball on their weak side a little uh, and measuring the distance and, and giving them a little bit of homework then to go away from your coaching session and say, look, at, I'll, I'll have a go at that there the next night with you again or striking off your weak side. I don't see much of that happening in the game and uh, you get them to go away and work on it. But I think as a coach, we should be, we should be informally skills testing everyone all the time yeah. because our, our job as coaches is to be big in observation. And if we're big in observation, we can spot and we can help fix the player through, through a challenge. So if I can go to a Martin Fogarty there, a Dara Cox or any player you pick on a night and say, listen, just my little observation is, you know, contested. You're not getting the distance in that shot for the score. You're not getting that shot off when you're contested on your weak side. What do you think? Now, I'd always ask the player, what do they think? Because what, what, what the coach thinks and what the player thinks can be two different thoughts. And then you get a middle ground and you get them to go away and, and practice it. But I think, Martin, this, the big thing and there about the skills testing is you've got to create the awareness in the player first. And when their mind is on it then, then there, there's an opportunity for improvement. You see, Dara, if you take the goal that we showed from Fergal Whiteley there, Dublin against Kilkenny, and the goal that Seamus Callan got, both of them off the ground, and I ask your players, by so many you could do that if the chance dropped to you. Most of them couldn't. So, like, I, I would regularly, you know, you have the players out. Every training session I'd be involved in will start with striking. Various striking, different nights, different types of striking. But regularly, the ball will be on the ground. And you're 10 yards away from me. And I'm poking right and I'm poking left. And this is seniors on the ground. Can you do it? And that could be a simple snig out that there's a player 10 yards away and he needs a quick pass on the ground. Can I do it? And then I put him back 20, then I put him back 30 and see, you know, can those balls go straight over without varying five or 10 meters? And if they can't, that player would not score that Jamie Cannon goal or the Fergal Whiteley one. And there are several, several other examples of goals got like that. But if I had time, there are equally so several examples of where players missed that opportunity. They stuck the hurl in the ground. A team in recent years lost an All-Ireland minor semi-final against Kilkenny. I won't say who the team was. A player had a, a ball presented. Oh, it was inside the big square. All he had to do was bang, pull the trigger, goal. Stuck the hurl in the ground and the ball trickled wide. Now that was an inter-county senior or an inter-county minor player at an All Ireland semi final, and that shouldn't have happened. So, you know, you could not do enough of that stuff. When we are doing games based sessions, uh, Martin, a question came in about systems of play. Damien mentioned the technical, the team playing, the tactical, uh, the, the, the need to be to the forefront of everything you're doing, I guess. But, but systems of play are, are, are we getting a bit bogged down when we start talking about stuff like that? Oh man, Dara, I tell you, I hate the word. I hate the word to be straight with you now, systems. I don't think there's such a thing. And I think if players are going out in their mind, we're on this system, we're on that system, they're wrecked. Now, I'm not saying for a second you wouldn't you wouldn't um you wouldn't work on a few little tactics. For example, if you have a bullet of a player in the forwards, right? I'm not saying for a second you wouldn't be trying to maybe isolate him or her you know, on a one-to-one -one situation and get a fast ball in. If you have a good catcher, you know, we just say if you have Joe Canning and um, I'm not saying for a second that I wouldn't in training, see, can we get him in there on the edge of the square fairly often 
in a one-to-one -one situation. But a system, because hurling is so fast. And if you're wondering what's the system, and this is where the more games you play in training, the systems will evolve without you even thinking about them. You know, players get so used to each other and they know what to do at the given time in a given second. You know, you cannot pre-program hurling. You're going in there with a ball and out of the corner of your eye, you see Damien cutting across in front of you. You have a split second to give him the ball or not give him the ball. So, oh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go near that, to be straight with you now. I mean, uh, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face, as Mike Tyson once said. Uh, what's your thoughts on it? Uh, yeah, look, I think um, a lot of the plans come through the coaching sessions. And, you know, I my belief is make the players automatic and equip them to make their own decisions. And everyone's human. We're all born flawed. There's, no one is going to get 100% of the stuff right 100% of the time. But, uh, yeah, look at... I, 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 there's a lot of systems in the game now. There's, you know, there's a lot of tactics, as let's say. But tactics, to me, in the very essence of the word, means decision-making ability of the player. So for me as a coach, I'm not looking to play seven or eight behind the ball or to do whatever. I'm trying to coach the player to make the best decision all the time when in possession or when not in possession. So I think that's our job as coaches is to tease that out of the player, challenge them on their decision-making ability and to get the best decisions the majority of the time, as opposed to bogging their minds with who stands where. You see, Dara, you know, you take a situation and, and, and maybe the system is to, to bring the ball out through the lines, as they say, you know, and, and you're out there around wing back maybe and you have this ball and you're supposed to work through the lines and suddenly you notice up the field there, Jamie Cannon and, and, and he's one on one. Sure, you'd be foolish, man, if you didn't land it up to him straight away. You know, or you know, if you're if you're in a system and you're supposed to raise the ball and take on your man, and, and you see a chance, a little flick into a guy in, inside there on the edge of the square. So that that's that's where I'd be coming from. If you, if you start to think for the players, I think you're lost. Now again, look at this is just opinion. You know, everybody's opinion is is important and is up to themselves. Uh, just on that, maybe, what, what is your opinion on picking the team and letting players know their roles? I, I, we're we're kind of in the same territory here, aren't we? Say that one again, Donnie. It's a question about telling players their roles within a team. Um, and the question says, would, would you be better off telling them a week beforehand, a day beforehand, or a minute beforehand, or tell them at all? Well, you know, a role, a role, I wouldn't, I wouldn't overemphasize a role. A role is go out and play as best you can. Now, if it's a man marking job, for example, okay, you might, you might specify that, that you have a player maybe that's, that's sticky, good at hooking and blocking, I mean, you might be targeting a, a, a top scorer on the other team. So, yes, I would do something like that, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't overrule it because, again, you have to, you have to be able to play it every way. Um, you know, you have no use telling a guy, um, you know, you're not going around the square there because you might have to go in around the square. Now, plus, you know, and, and talking tactics, a bit of common sense goes a long way as well. For example, you know, if, 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 I'm, if I'm playing there as a wing forward and, and I'm marking Jej Adlani, <laughs> oh, you're going to have a tactic. You're not going to be throwing balls down on top of me because I'm not going to catch them. So, I mean, there's a bit of feedback coming on your mic there. Just switch it off until, oh, sorry. until you're answered. Yeah, sorry, Martin. Yeah. Okay, is that is that answer that, Dara? Ah, it does, yeah. No, it does, in fairness. Yep. Um, just one or two more just before we finish things up. Uh, Brendan says there was doubting Thomas in the Bible that you were thinking earlier on, Martin. What's, what's that again? Oh, doubt. Uh, <laughs> yeah, just, that was him, all right, yeah. Doubting Thomas. Um... Yeah, well, I'd be kind of like that, all right. I'd, I'd, I'd have to see it with my own eyes, usually. You know? <laughs> uh, one, one here as well from, from Stephen as well came in to us, um, and it's a nice, it's a good little one as well. Um, I've coached a few different clubs, and the first thing I do is get the team sheets from the previous year 
and flip them around so the backs become forwards and the forwards become backs and you'd be surprised what you learn. Yeah, well, Dara, I mean, I'd be an advocate of that in a big way when you get the chance. Um, play the forwards as backs, play the backs as forwards. It's just win-win. I mean, you might get a gem out of it, but if you never did, you're, you're showing the back, you know, by putting them in the forwards, you're showing them how the other guy thinks. You're showing the forward, you shove them in into the backs and he sees, Jenny, uh, life is different here. So if you had, for example, a lazy forward and, um, you know, not inclined to move around much and you throw him into the backs then someday and he's marking a lively forward, he might see, Jenny, if you start moving around the field a bit, it can be beneficial. Um, Again, in, in a club, we can do those things, you know, and even in challenge matches, throw a few lads up in different positions and it's helpful. And what it also does, Dara, is um, it, it can reinvigorate a player. Sometimes you'll get a player who's getting a little bit stale. Um, you know, they're full back for years and throw them out centre back, throw them up in the forwards, the kid and give them a little bit of a new lease of life. And I said it in the goalies one. You know, I, I think, especially in club, you give a goalie a few games out to field regularly. And um, also, I said it, no harm saying it again, your sub goalie. If I had my way, uh, you know, your, my sub goalie would be an outfield player because he or she has got to be a very, very good player to stand in the sticks. And if they're a very, very good player, they're probably good enough to play out the field anyway. So those, those few little things, I think, are, are important, all right. So look at Dara, there's, there's still a few hundred people looking in here, but if, if you have a few more questions there, I'm happy enough to drag on a bit, Damien, as well, maybe. Yeah, one or two more in our eyes. So l let me go through them. A very interesting session, lots of common sense. Uh, find it hard to get the younger generation to agree with a lot of it, though. They think you need to be doing fancy stuff all the time. Is there any tips on how you can win them over to the more simpler ideas? Well, sure, look, at, that's like um, your mother telling you not to cross the road or, or don't, don't put your hand in the fire. Um, I suppose coming from a teaching background, I wouldn't be molly coddling them too much and, and you'd be, you know, they, they got to listen. And if, if they don't listen, they're, they're not going to improve. And I wouldn't be into spoiling them too much either. And again, all they have to do is listen to the top players if they get an opportunity to chat them and, and you know, any of them that I've met. I mean, if you look there in the goalies workshop, we had a little clip of Tommy Welch and his father and his son down in the garden playing three goals and in or playing goalies challenge. So, I mean, if it's good enough for him, that should be good enough for the next fella. And in my experience, um, you know, the, the players or the sports people that actually don't want to listen and know it all, they're, not, they're, not, they're only going to be mediocre players anyway. Whereas the ones, it's the same in the, in the classroom. You have a, a youngster there and, and, and they know it all. Well, they'll find out very, very quickly they don't. Whereas maybe a less talented uh, youngster that's prepared to go home and work on their own time and prepare to listen, they're the ones that are going to come through. And might I say, it's not always the most talented players that actually come through. Now, that's if coming through is the ultimate, which it's not, believe it or not. You know, I would just say to get players through to be as good as they possibly can be. It's not always those that have the most talent. It's those that are listening most and prepared to put in the most work. Um, if Damien wants to chip in on that one there, just turn on your mic, Damien. I turn off mine. It should stop the feedback. I know, Martin. I wouldn't have much more to add to that. Only, yeah, you, you know, the manager, the coach is in charge and everyone can't have an opinion. And again, we went back to the participant feedback and all that. But look, at, it is important that somebody is 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 running, the, holding the line there and uh, back to basics and whatever you're doing and um, once you're resourced and once you're sort of researched you know I don't think players will have a problem and pretty much if if, if, if you keep it games based what Martin's whole um, presentation there tonight with us was games based approach game centered I don't know too many players um, that don't get the challenge and the stimulation there and I think you're meeting the needs and the demands of the player there the whole time. You see, Dara, if they don't want to listen, I mean, we had a, a you could have been at it yourself, a provincial workshop, and um, we had a player with a few All Ireland medals, and I won't say who he is, but he was being questioned about about something, and um, you know, the guy was questioning him, 
wasn't listening to the advice that the player was given. And sure, I can remember that player saying, but sure, look at that's 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 what worked for me. That's up to yourself then whether you want to listen to me or not. So, you know, that's what it comes down to um, with, with players. You know, if they don't want to listen to the advice that the coaches are giving them, but sure, what can you do then? Only you know, let them off and play something else. Uh, is there a risk sometimes in that a player assessment or a, a, you know a self assessment that you're asking questions sometimes you don't really want the answer to that if you ask someone to come up with a, a problem they'll inevitably find one whereas if they were not asked they might have been happy enough I don't know if if, if that, that might come into it at all Martin. Well look at assessments I wouldn't um, first of all the, the assessments I would work and have done from time to time uh, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be a major one on my on my bucket list, and they they wouldn't be opened up to the field or to the floor or to or to the whole panel. It'd be be one on one. I'd ask a player, you know, Dara, you scribble out a few things there, and, and I'd have a chat with you. That'd be it. And um, ah, no, no. I mean, look at it. If there's, I think a manager or a coach or anyone, you have to be, you have to be open and prepared to listen. That doesn't mean you know you have to go do what someone is suggesting and I, I wouldn't to be honest with you several times if somebody tells me you know I think you're doing this wrong you're doing that wrong I'll hear them I listen I think about it but again if I'm convinced I'm doing it right well then I stick with that and the thing I, I think often coaches have to go with is their good feeling you know if you do something because you really really believe that's what you should do well then you can stand over that and that could be putting a team up and I would often say you're picking a team. Lads, says, this might not be the best team. But having considered it and thought about it, right now, this moment, that's the best team I can put up there. So that I can come back next week and if we're beaten by 20 points, well, I can say, look, at the time, that was the best team that I thought we could put out. No, it's just wrong. <laughs> and you would be wrong several times. You know, or a certain player, I think that's the player for tonight, that's the player to mark Dara Cox, and he gets cleaned out. Well, you know, if it was doing it again, they do the very same. If you do it for the right reasons, you can stand over it and you can live with yourself. But for certain, I would say to players, that's I, I don't have I don't have the gospel of this. You know, I could be wrong, but it's the best I can do. There's a there's a great little um insert as well here from another very experienced coach in Mickey Quigg out in New York who tells us that tone and, and the body language can be every much as important as what you're actually saying when, when it comes to dealing with one-on-one -on -one sessions but also comes to dealing with toxic situations yeah and, and Mickey good to see you there Mickey have you on board um th there's one thing I would say there there as well and it's not even answered the question that it's not a it's not a climb down for a coach or a manager to say I don't know it's not or I haven't a clue it's not a climb down to come into the dressing room when you're down eight or nine pints to say, lads, I don't know how we're going to get out of this. So look at Jenny, put your shoulder to the wheel, give it what you can, go out and see what happens. Now, because if you're bluffing or spoofing, lads, let's say throw it in a second. And you know, and you're coming in and you're, you're saying you do this, you do that, you do the other. It's no embarrassment and it's no climb down. As I said, some old saying goes, a, a person's man's great knowledge is in his awareness of his own ignorance. And um, again, you know, if there's a few players on the team, which there are in every team that are that are maybe experienced, especially with the older teams of being around a while, no harm in the slightest. It might not be, not, maybe not totally publicly, to say to the, the players, you know, what do you think? Where do you think the, play, the game is being lost? And that's not handing over total control to players. And, and there's nothing wrong with handing over control to players, but it is involving them. That, I mean, you go down... The middle of your pitch, for example. And I'm saying the middle of the pitch because they can see the players. They can see everybody else. You take your full back there. Your full back can see how, how the defence is going. So if that full back can see something that you don't see from the sideline, well, you're a harmless man or woman if you don't take that on board. And if you have a couple of experienced players and, and they're tuned in, you know, and not a guy that's going to be roaring and ball into you at the sideline. That's different. But somebody that you put a bit of sustenance in. That'll say to you, listen, I think we need to change the way we're playing this old game. We need to tighten up or whatever. I certainly would take that on board.
Okay, I mean, just on Mickey's point there about tone and body language, what's your thoughts on that? Turn on the mic, Damien. Grand, thanks, Martin. Um, yeah, Lucas, for sure, sure, it's part of communication skills and, you know, um, like it or, don't, or, or not like it, um, you're being judged when coaches arrive in, they're being judged on the, the body language, uh, the tone, the set, they're being judged on, you know, you're, you're being judged all night on everything you do and if you have, you know, if you have to have a harsh word with somebody, you're being judged on that as well. So, yeah, look at you're in the public gallery as a coach. You have thirty odd players, and you're, you, you know, you're on your own as an individual. But I, going back to making it all a team, everyone collectively working together, the collaboration. I think that's the big one there, Dara. Where, you know, coaches in, in, embed themselves as part of the group. I know you have to hold the line, and I know you have to have the accountability part, but. Uh, the coach shouldn't be alien to the group. I see a lot of that too, where, you know, I'm going to bark out the orders and you do what I say and say what I do and the whole lot. So look at, I, I think that the coaches need to be embedded as part of the group, but for sure, Mickey, the, the body language is big and the tone is big and you're being judged all the time. Mickey, your own body language, boy, was very good there. You brought your team over from New York last year in the World Games and, and, and won it out there in Crow Park. It's a pity I didn't have a video camera because I'll tell you, your body language boy, was, yeah, if it could bottle it, it was mighty. And I was delighted to see your team winning. And um, I was extra delighted in, in, in that um, an old club colleague of mine, a young lad, uh, immigrated to America about 30 years ago. His son was the captain. And it was funny, I knew, I knew that his son was coming over to play. And in one of the earlier matches down in Waterford, I picked him out without ever knowing him. He had the same shape, he had the same strike as the old fella. Well, the old fella is young enough. He's only around the 50. But, um, so, Mickey, fair play to you and fair play to you for what you're doing in New York. Um, we'll be talking a little bit with you in a webinar shortly, hopefully. All right, say take maybe two more. Um, we still have a good few people in here, but I'm just mindful of the clock. Yeah, we might even have two more, to be honest with you, Martin. We're, 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 we've gone through pretty much yep. all of the ones in front of me. There is... Just a comment on uh, your choice of music to kick tonight's webinar off. A lot of compliments for that one, uh, Martin. And the suggestion that uh, the banks of our own lovely Lee will have to come out at some stage as well. Yeah, well, look, we'll, we'll consider the old bank space because, um, oh, I won't comment. Um, yeah, the music <laughs> was interesting. The music was uh, was, was um, a bit of mining. I don't know what came into my head during the week. Um, a, lot of, a lot of the guys I heard with in the club underage their fathers were all miners. And um, those pictures there were of the local mines here that closed in, in my town in 1969 when you had 600 boys and men down working. And um, I often thought of it, a lot of guys that could have been good players, but when they were 14, they went down in the mines just out the road from here. And, and, and that was, it was very hard to become a hurler after that. But equally so, some of, some of the great characters that looked after us in later years were miners. And one man in particular, and he was nearly killed in the mine. A half a ton of a rock fell on him three three miles down underground. And he was he was the father of a friend of mine, but he survived it and he came out, he was dragged out, and he was he was fairly shook, but he he um he looked after us for years and years at underage. So I don't know where that old song that came out of it just came into my head during the week. So we'll 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 think about the banks, but sure, if we play the banks, then Damien Common will want. Ah, oh, the Galway girl or something like that, but um, what do you think, Damien? The Damian? West Awake, West Martin. The West Awake, I think the West is asleep, Damien. <laughs> <laughs> i tell you what, we'll, we'll see if we get the Galway girl maybe next week. <laughs> or an old friend of mine over there in Galway, maybe a few pals over there could be listening in. The Galway girl we might play it for. No matter. All right, all right. I think that's us pretty much, uh, everyone, everyone, and thanks to everyone that did get involved with questions and comments and a lot of praise as well for, for some of the stuff you were putting out earlier on, Martin. People asking if, if it's possible to get printouts of some of the slides you would have shown. Is that possible? Um, what you're looking at, we'll be, we'll be, we'll be putting up this on, online there tomorrow, hopefully. Kelly and usually looks after that for his fair play to her. Um, so if, if they want the slides in some ways, tend to send me an email and, um, we can we can let them onto them in some format, maybe PDF or something in that line. So anything anyone wants like that, just maybe rather than 
bombarding you with emails. Just just send on a, an email to us there and we'll send out what we can to you. Yeah, I'm sure a local GPO or GDA in any of the counties will be able to, to source them as well. Yeah, yeah, well, we can make an email out on there that's that's of, of, of you. So, so look at folks, we'll, we'll close the shop here now and um, thank you very much. And a big thank you there to Damien and Dara again for, for their, their input and, and sharing their knowledge. So, uh, I, I, no point in saying, I was nearly going to say a safe home. So look at enjoy the cup of tea there. Okay, take care.